Hello and welcome to another video from Carl's Tech Shed. Well, as I explained in one of my previous videos, um, this is one of the items I picked up at the car boot sale the other day um, with the sole intention of doing a teardown on it. Um, this is an internet surf set IBX200 by Bush. Um, this was an internet uh, set top box designed for TVs here in the UK. Um, this was sold by Argos, Toys R Us and a few other retailers about 12 to 15 years ago. Um, it wasn't very successful uh, and in the end I think that a lot of the companies ended up more or less giving these away in order to get them off the shelves um, simply because they, they weren't up to the modern standards of a computer even at that time. They were very basic. Um, they were more marketed at, um, at getting people online rather than giving them quality of internet access. Um, so it was a very cut down version of the internet with only news, email, sport and a basic web browser. Um, you certainly wouldn't be able to watch uh, on demand video or anything like that. A lot of that was far in the future when this was designed. So when we open the box, as we can see, we've got uh, a series of manuals here. Uh, now the first thing that's, that you can see here is, a, is an amendment um, to the manual. So they've obviously um, printed up all the manuals and they've realised that there was a slight uh, problem with the design. So uh, they've just corrected a, a they've just corrected a little diagram here. But that's not uncommon to see on on uh, on products where a manual has been slightly uh, misprinted or, or the design isn't isn't exactly perfect. Now we've also got a quick start guide here. Um, all this covers is how to connect the box up to your TV uh, and how to get it onto the internet. Um, it doesn't really give you any more information than that. There's a helpline on the back which is, uh, well, it's char it was charged at a pound a minute, so that's an incredibly expensive helpline, uh, especially for a product which at the time, um, towards the end of its shelf life, only cost around £30. Um, so a pound a minute to set up your £30 internet set-top box is quite a lot of money. Um, then we've got the user guide here which uh, is more in depth, it shows you how to get online, it shows you uh, what all the different keys do on the keyboard, it shows you how to connect to the internet, gives you some troubleshooting and it gives you a basic, um, a basic understanding of the graphical user interface uh, on, this board, on, on this box. So it, it's quite an in-depth manual, it's quite interesting as well. Uh, bear in mind it's all black and white so uh, any colour coded keys would be possibly quite difficult to decipher from this. Uh, now here we've got uh, an online setup guide to using email so now as you can see this has been printed in colour so they obviously found from earlier models that customers were complaining perhaps that um, they couldn't figure out exactly how to set up email um, so they've printed this small colour guide so all of the colour coded buttons would show up a lot clearer in this again it just shows you a basic idea on how to set up your own email accounts so you can receive email through here um, but that's about it for documentation. Now we've got the keyboard here. Now this is a wireless infrared keyboard, so it works uh, on the same principle as a normal infrared remote control. That you've got this black bar here, um, which has a couple of uh, IR LEDs behind it, and that will just send the signal over to the box in exactly the same way that your remote control would to your Skybox or something similar. Uh, this is a standard, it looks like a standard QWERTY keyboard, but instead of having the F4 function keys uh, at the top here, so you'd have F1 to F12, uh, instead of that you've got internet uh, web browser specific keys, so you've got home, previous, next, go to, and so on and so on. And up in the top corner here you've got the internet button, so this is like a quick way of connecting to the internet. Um, so you can see that this was more designed for ease of use rather than functionality overall. Um, it was it was designed purely to get people online uh, and once you you know once you wanted something more uh, less basic or more advanced um, you'd then obviously want to go and buy a PC because uh, when this was released in the early 2000s um, not, not nowhere near as many people had computers and certainly not as many had internet access so this was a quick, cheap and easy way of getting online. 
Now in the bottom here, um, you'll have to remember that this was long before the days of HDMI. Uh, we've got a standard 21 pin SCART cable um, to plug in the back of the TV. So uh, here we've got this one, it's about one metre, so it's quite standard for this sort of kit. Um, we've got a very, very long telephone lead. Um, I haven't opened this up. As you can see, it's still brand new and sealed, um, but I'm, I'm guessing there's probably at least five, possibly even 10 metres of cable on there. Um, it's got a standard BT connection. It's also got a pass-through so you can plug your telephone directly into that um, so you won't need a second phone socket uh, to connect this up with. Now here we've just got a standard uh, trans AC transformer here. Um, this is manufactured by DVE so this is obviously a third-party transformer they've bought here. Um, input is uh, 230 to 240 volts so Again, it's not designed for use outside the UK, uh, and, seeing, uh, and because we run on 230 volts AC here, um, that's why you haven't got the 100 to 110 volts for the USA. Uh, it gives out 10 volts at 850 milliamps, which uh, is going to be more than enough for what we want for this. You know, the, the current rating is going to be fine. And last but certainly not least, uh, we've got the box, the, the actual internet box in the bottom here. Again, as far as I'm aware, this has never been powered up, so um, this is going to be quite interesting to see how this uh, boots up and, and how the graphical user interface is run. Now, as you can see on the front here, there's no buttons whatsoever. Um, there's an infrared receiver. Uh, there's a couple of LEDs here on here, one for power, one to show that the box is online. Um, there's a couple of screws either side here and here, and here we've got a DC input, we've got a SCART here, um, this is to go out to the TV, we've got a second SCART port which recommends either going to an auxiliary such as an AV receiver or, uh, or a VCR, and lastly we've got a print, and almost lastly we've got a printer port here. Um, this is a standard IEEE 1284 port, so um, you would be able to connect something else up to this other than a printer. Um, there is actually a website, I'm going to pop a link down uh, on this video, um, there's actually somebody who's able to be, uh, who's been able to connect a zip drive um, to this, a 100 megabyte zip drive, and they've put custom firmware onto the box so they can boot it up into, uh, into their, own, their own operating system. Um, again, I'll, po I'll post a link to that. And uh, finally, we've got the telephone line input here. Now, this is just a standard RJ11 jack, so this would then connect up to the phone line. And uh, inside, I'm guessing we're probably going to have some sort of, uh, we're going to have some sort of modem. I don't think it's going to be 56k. Um, I haven't looked at the specs, but for something like this, 56k is probably going to be a bit too fast. So it's probably going to be around 33.6k maybe 28, I'm not sure, but I wouldn't have thought it'd be much faster than 33.6k, but we'll have a look. But yeah, I mean, that's 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 really all I can say about the exterior of the box. Uh, apart from that, we've got a serial number on the bottom, we've got the model number and the power input, but that's about it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect this up to my TV, and uh, we're going to see, uh, see how it powers up. Well, now that I've connected the box up to my TV, um, I've also commandeered the um, telephone line cable from my fax machine, so uh, we'll see if we can get online with this. I highly doubt it because, I mean, this box was made 15 years ago, uh, but we'll see how far we get and we'll, we'll see what happens. So I've got the keyboard here in front of me, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to press the internet key on the box, and you'll see that the LED goes green. Now we've got two options here. We've got World Wide Web or options, so I'm going to select World Wide Web here. Right, well it's dialing out, it's uh, dialing out an 0845 number, so that's uh, obviously a here, here in the UK that's a semi premium rate phone number, I think it's about 10 pence a minute or something like that. We'll see how long this takes to connect. Well, after about seven minutes of trying to connect, it's now given me an error message which says that the main page for the internet service provider cannot be displayed at the moment. Um, it's now giving me an option to look at other websites, so uh, let's see how it does with something simple like Google.
Now as you can see the small um, the small logo in the, in the bottom right corner of the two cogs are turning um, so I'm guessing that indicates that it's loading. It's definitely connected to the internet because the LED on the box indicates that it's connected. Um, it's incredibly slow. Uh, I'm not sure if it's actually going to connect. Um, it, it's, it's going to be a 50-50 whether it connects or not. Yeah, after about two or three minutes of uh, attempting to load that web page, it, it just kept turning and turning uh, with the little logo, and nothing was loading. Um, so I decided to to uh, to end the, the loading, and uh, I decided to go into the options to see what we've got. Um, so this page here, you've got a few options. You've got uh, text printers, telephone call waiting, timeouts, and copyright. So uh, just out of curiosity, I thought to see what printers are supported by this. Um, as you can see, the whole user interface is, is very large, and the reason for this is because this was designed for the old, uh, black, uh, the old CRT TVs, um, which had a very low resolution compared to today's uh, HDMI-enabled uh, full HD TVs, so obviously because the resolution was a lot lower, you needed uh, everything to be much bigger. So as you can see here, this supports um, four different or five different printers. You've got the Canon uh, BJC 1, 1 and 2000, you've got Lexmark 1000 and 1100, and you've got Lexmark Z11. Now, um, Lexmark stopped manufacturing um, consumer-based uh, inkjet printers a few years ago now. Uh, Canon, um, I think they still make a few, but I'm sure all of these models would be obsolete and it's probably going to be incredibly difficult to get the cartridges for them. So I'm sure if you had any other printer, um, it's, it's going to be practically impossible to connect it to this because it's only got a limited set of drivers. Um, it does allow you to print in colour or black and white, so if you were on a budget and you didn't want to print everything in colour and you just wanted to print in black and white, then you can do that. So we'll see what else is on here. Um, let's go back out of this. Now as you can see we've got text uh, which is size and scaling so um, you can select what size the, uh, the text is on the screen. Um, you've got some dialing options. Uh, now I, I was originally, uh, initially I was quite excited when I saw this because I was hoping it would give me the option to change the phone number that, di that it dials out to but unfortunately it doesn't. It just asks you whether you want pulse dialing or tone dialing and a few other options. Uh, on top of that we've got whether you turn off call waiting, um, you've got automatic hang up so if it's connected for a certain length of time and uh, nothing is actually active then you can uh, have it disconnect from the phone line and finally we've got a few copyright acknowledgements here. Uh, as you can see this runs RISC OS NC, um, the hardware is made by Pace Micro Technology 87 to 2000 and the browser is made by Ant Limited. Um, there's several pages of information here. Um, if anyone wants this information, I'll see if I can put a link up to it on the on the bottom of this video. But apart from that, there's not really much else I can show you because it's not actually connecting to the internet. And, um, well, because this is an internet box, that's all it's designed to do. Uh, I don't have any custom firmware for this, so unfortunately that's all I can show you on the user interface. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it off, I'm going to unplug everything, and uh, we're going to see what's inside it. Okay, well now that I've taken the lid off, um, what you can see here is a very nice board layout. Um, it looks very well designed. Uh, there's one obvious bodge here which uh, isn't too much of a problem because it's been bodged properly. Um, as you can see here we've got a very small resistor which is just going between two points. Um, but what they've done is uh, they've also put a piece of plastic underneath to insulate uh, the, the component from the rest of the board but also they've glued the component down to this as well and uh, this, this piece of plastic isn't going anywhere anytime soon it's, it's been properly uh, glued down to the board so it's, it's possibly the, most likely the best way to bodge this uh, if you have to 
because obviously once you've produced you know a few a few thousand of these and you find a very minor problem um, which is it's going to be solved by a simple uh, component in one place like this you don't really want to go scrapping all of those boards or or redesigning it just for that so a simple uh, a nice clean tidy and safe bodge like this is is probably the best way to do it so um, yeah we've done a really good job on that now we'll start over here at the power supply. Uh, as you can see it's just a, a basic DC to DC converter because the uh, high voltage step down is done in the mains transformer which sits outside the box obviously. Um, we've got a small power transistor here uh, and power regulator so what this is doing is it's taking the uh, 10 volts in and stepping that down to 5 volts and 3.3 volts. Now this is done by, this is configured by having the two uh, small resistors on the board here so these resistors uh, just on the board here. These actually set the voltages which this gives out. Um, the input on this component is actually anything up to 40 volts so it can step down uh, to any, any voltage between 0 and 40 volts so it all depends on what type of resistor you put here. Uh, as you can see we've got a small diode here and we've got another capacitor here um, but that's about all, all there is in terms of, um, in terms of uh, a power supply in this. Now if we go over here we see that we've got two of these socketed uh, ROM ICs. Uh, now these are manufactured by MX but they've actually, they've actually got the um, they've actually got the the data written onto the onto the top of it, so you can see this is uh, RISC OS NC. Uh, now, although these chips look identical at first, they've got the same pin count, obviously. And uh, if if you look, you know, if you if you were to just uh, have a quick look, you'd see they look more or less the same. But the part numbers are very slightly different. So you can see this one is uh, 4264, this one is 4764. So obviously these, these are meant to work as a pair. Um, you'd, you wouldn't have one or, or the other, you'd have them working as a pair. So half of the, uh, half of the firmware is going to be on one, half of the firmware is going to be on the other. Um, it, it, it's, it's, a very good way of, um, it's a very good way of putting uh, software into something like this, especially in a socketed uh, IC package because it means that if you were to upgrade, you know, if, if the manufacturer decides to upgrade um, the system, you wouldn't, uh, let's say you've got a few thousand of these sitting around, um, but suddenly you find a problem with firmware, you don't need to rework the whole board by you know, desoldering components, you simply open the boxes up, take these chips out, uh, replace replace them with the new ROMs and and you're away so uh, that's a very good way of doing it also um, obviously this is just a, by, uh, a byproduct of their design but um, it means that the user if you want to tinker with this um, you could actually put in maybe a, a couple of your own ROMs or even a couple of EEPROMs um, if they've been properly programmed and run your own cost, uh, custom firmware on this which uh, I'm, as far as I'm aware people have actually done but uh, they've actually run the uh, their own firmware from a zip drive and plug that into the parallel port as I mentioned at the back over here which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but yeah I mean you can replace these if you had to. Now over here we've got uh, four memory ICs, these are just standard uh, SRAM ICs, these are two, uh, two megabytes a piece so these are 16 megabits. Um, We've got a Cirrus Logic. This is the main uh, ice, this main processor here. This is a Cirrus Logic uh, ARM-based processor. This has uh, th this is a 40 megahertz processor, um, which which runs RISC OS from uh, the ROMs. Uh, there's an incredibly detailed data sheet, so I'll see if I can link that down on the video because there's so much to go through on this. I, I think I'd spend the rest of the video just talking about all the specifications of it. So if you're interested in that, um, I'll, I'll leave that. Uh, I'll leave the data sheet on the bottom of this, so you can have a proper look at that. Now over here we've got this small IC here. Now you might look at this and think it were a, an op amp or uh, or something like that, but it's not. This is actually uh, a digital to analog converter, or, or more specifically, it converts the digital video signal coming out of the processor into a standard uh, PAL signal. So this can go over to the SCART socket. Uh, effectively, without this chip, you haven't got a TV interface. All you've got is a computer with no uh, graphics card. So in a way, yes, this 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 is a very extremely important chip because without this you wouldn't be able to throw the picture up onto the TV. Now uh, as you can see we've got a lot of uh, 
discrete components. We've got a lot of small transistors, resistor arrays, uh, these small uh, capacitors. Uh, there's a few few other smaller components here. Uh, many many resistors and small SMD capacitors. So um, these are all going to be linked into the SCAR sockets, which are directly on the back here. So this is all going to be uh, to do to to do with signal processing and uh, reducing interference and uh, ensuring that the frequencies are correct. Now over here we've got a very small IC here. Um, I, I I looked this part number up, um, but I couldn't find what it was. But I'm guessing that's probably going to be uh, some sort of uh, logic gate or something like that, um, just based by its by its position. Um, there's a small crystal here. I'll be honest. I haven't looked up what what frequency this is, um, but this this would uh, this would give the um, processor its it, its uh, clock speed effectively. Now down here we've got uh, a small Fairchild semiconductor uh, IC. Uh, this is just a seventy seven four HC T eight six A. Um, now over here we've got uh, an MS, uh, sorry, SMSC uh, floppy disk controller. Now you might wonder what a floppy disk controller is doing in a in a device like this. Now when I looked at the data sheet on this, although it's a floppy controller, it has native IEEE 1284 support. So what they're doing is they're using this uh, to to run the parallel port. Now an interesting, another interesting fact about this is that it's actually got infrared capability. So although the IR, the, the infrared receiver is over here down the bottom, I'm not sure whether this is decoded in the processor or whether they're actually uh, running this through the, the multi-layer board, uh, running the tracks through the multi-layer board over to this over to this IC to have it decoded here. It, it's, uh, it's certainly a possibility. Now over here we've got um, we've got the Lucent um, modem. Uh, this is this is a digital to analog converter for the modem. Um, we've also got another small modem IC down here. Now I couldn't find what speed this was, and um, unfortunately Bush don't actually publish uh, what speed this modem is. So um, I'm just going to have to take an educated guess that this is going to be around 33.6k. Um, I doubt it would be any faster than that, simply because of of what it does. Um, what I did find was interesting down here, that although we've got the the ROMs on this side of the board, over here we've we've got a small uh, eight, we've got a small uh, CMOS chip, which uh, is effectively like a PC BIOS. It's it's uh, 256k uh, EEPROM, so that's obviously going to be holding some sort of firmware. So this could be for the modem. Well, oh, that's what I thought initially, and then I noticed this small uh, ROM chip over here, which is uh, also 256k. So I'm not sure what this this is for. I mean, an to take, if I had to take an educated guess, I'd say that this one had something to do with the modem, and maybe this was uh, some sort of uh, initial boot up for the processor um, before it reads the ROM ICs. I'm not entirely sure. And then just over here we've got a small pin header. Um, now there's no mention of this in the manual and there's nothing on the silk screen uh, around it to suggest that it's uh, JTAG, RS-232 or anything standard like that. So uh, my best guess is that this is going to be for initial configuration in the factory or maybe even a test point or something like that. Um, now, apart from that, um, we can have a look at the modem side of the board, which is uh, again, it's been it's it's incredibly well designed. Uh, even even taking safety into consider uh, into consideration, because you've got a very large uh, amount a very large creepage distance between the uh, the modem components here, which are connected onto the phone line. And uh, the rest of the board. Now, the reason for doing this is because obviously the uh, the AC. Uh, power supply over here is protected with uh, with a fuse. Um, you've got a diode. You've got, and even in the uh, in the transformer, you'll have some sort of um, safety cutout. Um, whereas on the phone line, um, for example, if you to get a power surge on the phone line, uh, that could you know that could be anything up to several thousand volts. And you need to account for that uh, when you're designing these, because the last thing you want is to have several thousand volts flowing into this, and then, uh, well, obviously it's going to cause damage. But what you want to limit is uh, is the safety risk um, to the user. So what they've done is they've left a huge distance uh, all along this board between any any pins, any pin headers, and any connectors. Uh, they've left a big empty space between those and the rest of the board. So if this were to fail, it's going to fail 
safely which means yes it will it's inevitable that it will cause irreparable damage to the device uh, but most importantly it's it's going to fail in such a way that it's going to cause a, a minimal risk to the user which is very important when it comes to things like this now uh, Apart from that, that's that's all I can really say about this. Um, obviously, I'm sure I'm going to have a few questions about it, and uh, I'll do my best to answer those. But, um, yeah, well, thanks very much for watching, and uh, I'll try and get a few more teardown videos up very soon.